is a very tiny mug. This is um, Duncan beans, which isn't very good. Of course, I don't think people go to Duncan specifically for black coffee. So 12 Minutes was this game that I played. I went to go read a bunch of reviews and I found out that not everyone likes this game. People who seem to love it seem to really, really love it. And people who don't like it uh, seem to not like it because of how obtuse the puzzles are. And that's really interesting to me because it has a lot of design implications. Because if you're going to call out a game for having bad puzzles, what that means is that it didn't really communicate itself well. This game's genre is known as a point and click puzzle. And point and click puzzles have kind of a troubled history with game design. And it's because, well, they started as text adventures back in the day. So if you remember a game called Adventure or Zork, those are two games that are one text box and then you type in commands, things like look west or walk east or something like that, or get shovel. The text would describe where you are in a place and then it would like say what items are here and what items are there. It wasn't until this game development team uh, started making visuals for their text adventures that this kind of point and click thing started evolving. They created this thing, whatever that is, and then they created King's Quest. And King's Quest really set the bar on this kind of growing genre of the point and click. One of the things that was never really clear in text adventures was communicating to the player exactly what it is that they're supposed to do. If you looked at a paragraph and it said something like, you're near a farmhouse, you see a door, and there's a key by the map. Maybe you would want to get the key, so you have to say, you know, take key, and it's like, I'm not sure what you mean. You're like, get key, walk to house, look at house, look at key, get key. You have to figure out what the language is in order to obtain the things that you want and then do the things that you want. When it got to the actual using the mouse and pointing on stuff and clicking on stuff, it basically copied the same kind of design that they had before, where it was just experimentation craziness. There was a Windows 3.1 game that I played called uh, Dare to Dream by Epic Mega Games. I wonder if that's the same as Epic Games. So in Dare to Dream, there were these scenes in there that are not very well explained. They're just, they kind of assume that the player is going to be pointing and clicking everywhere. When you first look at Dare to Dream from the very first screen, you're in a little alleyway and in front of you is just a bunch of items that all looks like it was made in MS Paint. When you put your cursor over some of these items, some of them change your cursor into a magnifying glass, but not all of them. It makes you think, well, what items can I click on and what items can't I click on? Well, it's gonna be up to you. You're gonna have to search everywhere and it can take some time. Nothing is obvious on this screen. You, you can't really tell what things you can click on, what things you can't, but it turns out, yeah, you can click on that balloon, that little balloon down there. Yeah, the little deflated piece of rubber. You can take that. And the underwear up there on that line up there. Yeah, you can take the underwear. Not not sure why. You can't, can't do anything else in here. Just take those two items. It turns out what you're supposed to do is go around the building uh, to the boat back on the dock, search the middle of the boat, not the top or the bottom, but the middle, to find a dead fish. Take that dead fish back to the bar, into the empty bar, double click on the door and use the fish to unlock the door. So this is the kind of stuff that existed in those kinds of games and it's really strange because it is just experimentation. You just have to experiment over and over until you find something that works. And it's kind of crazy in Dare to Dream specifically because when you get to this moment with this guy, after you've unlocked the door with the fish, get this little uh, tub of petroleum jelly that's sitting by him, which again doesn't even look like you can click on it. Use that petroleum jelly to squeeze it into a grate outside. Go underneath that, go into a sewer with toxic waste, and use the underwear to go on top of the toxic waste to search the barrel. Look in the barrel, find the shotgun, take the shotgun back to the boat, shoot the boat's window. Something flies out and goes into the water, but you don't know what it is and you can't get to it, how do you get to it? Well, you gotta go back to the bar and talk to that dude again. Say, hey, do you have any fishing gear? He's gonna say, no, he doesn't. And if I did, why would I give it to you? So take the gun, shoot him. He'll give you fishing gear. Use the fishing gear to get the stuff out of the water. It gets kind of nuts. And it's really cool, at least when you're a kid or if you're a person who likes this kind of genre, it's really cool to find all of those weird things that you can do. I, I remember being blown away when I could fill up the balloon 
with helium and then use it to float above the building. That was just insane to me because I was like, as soon as I did it, I, was, I just lost my mind. I was like, that's amazing. That's so cool. And I remember finally beating that game and I just thought how amazing of an experience. Of course, I was a kid and I was, you know, I was losing my mind because I was discovering things. It was, it was a point of discovery. I wasn't going into the game with the same frame of mind that I do with games today, right? Games today explain themselves a little bit more and they're less, you know, cryptic about everything. And so it's like when you look at these kinds of games, like in Castlevania 2, for example, is another one where you have to decipher a lot of the stuff that these people tell you in order to do things in the game. But that kind of stuff can be really interesting if you're a person who likes that kind of design. And if you don't, well, that, that sucks that you're just not going to play the game. So knowing that we're coming from that kind of history, 12 minutes actually takes that and just really, really does a good thing with it. Makes the game design really talk to the player and really communicate proper mechanics. Actually teaches the player how to play the game. Even hints at, at solutions a lot. It gives a lot of hints. But if you're not a person who's looking for that kind of stuff, you're probably going to miss out on it. So we're going to take a look at some of these hints and see how it is that 12 minutes hints to the player to get to the solution. And this is going to spoil the entire game of 12 minutes. I'm so sorry. If you want to play 12 minutes, then play it before you watch this video, because uh, we're going to spoil all of it, uh, including, you know, like the solutions and stuff, which you're supposed to do. So that's your warning. Three, two, one. First, let's see how 12 minutes teaches the goal of the game and how to play the game. It does this through inciting curiosity, constraining movement, drawing attention, narrowing focus, building a skill, and rewarding that skill. So when you first enter the game, you enter the game through an elevator, and it's first person perspective. The doors open and you see straight across from you uh, three doors at the end of the hall. That incites curiosity by itself, right? You look at those doors and you're like, Oh God, I want to open it! Now, interesting thing about this building, there's only one hallway straight from the elevator, and I'm sure some buildings are like this, but most buildings, I think, would have a hallway that goes down both ways. But this is very constrained. It's specifically designed for the player to interact with these elements. So what happens is when you come out of uh, the elevator, you see the awesome carpet from The Shining, which is pretty sweet. It put me in that little mood of, oh, I wonder if something supernatural is going to be happening. That's pretty cool. Then you see these two paintings. The reason why you see the two paintings is because of that halo of light that's happening around here. You can see that the light is only lighting up those two paintings, and specifically those two paintings, because they have circles of light around them. You can see that they're pretty much highlighted for the player. There's a little prompt at the bottom of the character on the ground that says, use the cursor to interact with objects. And since those are the only two objects that you've seen so far, you try to interact with them and boom, you understand exactly what to do. You can click on those objects to interact with them. And it's really interesting because that is straight teaching the player. I mean, that's a far cry from what you did with Dare to Dream, right? That is a far, far cry. You go down the hallway and you go down to that one door. And if you hover your cursor over the other doors, you can see that they all say locked in parentheses, which tells you that you probably can't go through the door. But not only that, these other two doors are just called doors, while the one in front of you is called front door. That shows you that there's something specific about that door that you should be thinking about. It's subtle, but it's there. The only other object in here that you can interact with is a plant. And it makes sense because there's nothing else in the scene. It's not like, again, looking at Dare to Dream, you see all that stuff on the ground. You can interact with, might as well interact with all of it. Try to hover your cursor over everything. Why can't I look through those boxes? Why can't I knock on that window? Why can't I pick up any of the myriad of objects that are here? What about the other clothes on the clothesline? Like that, that stuff just doesn't matter, apparently. So in here, all you have to see is that one plant. There's other doors and one plant, and that's it. And so the player goes, oh, well, to see what's in that plant, right? You click on the plant and there's a little rock. And it's just weird because like the rock, like you don't see rocks in potted plants a lot. So when you hover your, your cursor over it, then it says fake rock. Awesome. You feel like you're experimenting and yet you didn't have to do the searching that you did with these other games. So that is awesome. That's really, really cool. So boom, you take the rock, you uh, click on it in your inventory after it teaches you what to do. And then you find a key. You take that key, go through the door and now You've started your 12 minute loop and you already know how to interact with the world around you. Really cool. Okay, so now we're going to talk about trying to get to that solution. 
the goal in the game overall is to uncover the truth of what's happening in this repeating reality. So the thing that happens over and over in the game, it's 12 minutes from when you enter the apartment to when this man comes in, starts accusing your wife of murder, demands a watch that she has, some kind of stopwatch, and then kills both of you. In order to unveil the truth of what's happening here, there's a series of things that you have to do, for one of the solutions anyways, there's many solutions you can do. The solution involves giving your wife sleeping pills so that she looks unconscious when she goes to bed. And then when this man comes in, you're supposed to hide in the closet so that he comes in, discovers the wife, and thinks she's dead, goes over to the room, flips the light switch, and then gets electrocuted because of the faulty wiring. And falls down. And so you go over there while he's down and cuff him. And then because at this point you've known so much uh, about the history of what's happening, you get to the point where you need to ask him about the nanny that your father-in-law had an affair with, and then he tries to remember the name, and in order to jog his memory, you have to show him a baby onesie that has a name on it. So that's the solution, and it's pretty complicated, pretty dang complicated, but it uses game design to guide the player in the right direction, whereas Dare to Dream doesn't. There's more to the story that I'm not really saying here, uh, and if you like weird, dark, twisted stories, this might be a good game to play. We're gonna see how they teach giving the sleeping pills, setting the booby trap, hiding in the closet, and showing the baby onesie. So as soon as you enter the apartment, then there's a few things that are happening here. One, all the lights are turned off. Uh, there's someone in the bathroom. She then talks to you about dessert, let me know when you're hungry, and then comes over and turns on the light. That is a hint. Because later on, you see the bedroom. The bedroom is dark, and if you go to explore in the bedroom, you understand that you can turn on the light. So you do that, and it sparks. Yeah. It's hinting to you that that is something that is happening that you should take notice of. And even if you don't do that, if you tell your wife, you know, that, hey, I'd like to, let's do some dessert right now, then she says, okay. She goes over to the bedroom to get her surprise present that she's going to surprise you with, uh, turns on the light, and says this. Which, again, is another, you know, indication of just letting the player know there's something with that light switch. Part of the solution is to drug your wife with sleeping pills. When you start the game, she has a coffee mug right beside her. There's another one in the sink. Uh, at some time during the game, she'll grab the cup, walk over to the sink, turn it on, fill the cup with water, and drink it. Or if you move the cup, then she'll go over to a different cup, fill that one with water, and drink it. Or if you take both cups... Where are all the glasses? When you go to the medicine cabinet, there's this bottle of sleeping pills that is very highlighted. It looks like it's lit up. There's someone outside that's apparently uh, doing some sort of lawn work, and there's a window right here, so you can hear it. That's nice. It's like ambience, you know? It's like letting you know I'm, I'm at a home office. We're not at a studio here. It's just, it's just a constant reminder that this is real. This is cinema verite. When you try to take the sleeping pills and put them in a mug, he'll say something like, These pills are huge. I should dissolve them. So you understand, oh, you gotta put them in water, and then you put two and two together. Oh, the wife's thirsty, you gotta put them in water, you give them to her. And then she does that, she goes to bed, and then falls asleep. But more importantly, she turns the light back off. So if at this point you decide to turn on the light, then you'll get electrocuted. Or if the guy comes in and he turns on the light, he'll get electrocuted. And because of that sparking of the switch, the player understands that there's a certain amount of steps to get to that electrocution, which means they can use it as a booby trap. There's a closet nearby, and you wouldn't know that you could interact with the closet without the wife saying so. The wife says, Oh, we gotta clean that closet. If you click into the closet, you can see that the character comes all the way inside, which is a hint that you can actually be inside the closet without being inside the room, which means you can probably close that door also. And then when this dude comes in, uh, even when you're just out in the open here, he'll take you and he'll uh, cuff you, and then he'll go over to the room and 
be you know dumbfounded about what he's found. You put another two and two together, you know that you can set up the little booby trap of a light switch. It feels like you're discovering things and it feels like you're experimenting, but you're not doing the experimentation so much that you were back in like these other you know Windows 3.1 style games. Like those games, those kinds of point and click things are true experimentation. You have to throw everything at the wall to see what sticks. And this one is really giving you a ton of little hints here and there. And I love it. One of the things that I think is really cool is the line that the wife says when she comes out of the bathroom. I didn't hear you come in. What that tells the player is that, you know, precisely that she doesn't, she didn't hear the player when they came in, which means you can do something there before she comes out of the bathroom and she won't know that you did it. So for example, you could hide in the closet and she won't think that's your home. She'll just come out and just things will happen the way they happen. And so the reason why that's important is because you can do that and she'll reveal a secret that she's been keeping. The one thing that I found was troubling a lot of players, and it did trouble me a little bit too, was the last part of the puzzle, the last part of the solution. But one of the last steps that you have to do is show the cop a onesie. Show the cop a baby onesie that was presented to you as a present uh, from your wife from like a different time loop. So what makes you think you have to do that? I've seen a lot of reviews where players are like, you have to do what? You have to show him a onesie? What the f That doesn't make any sense. It actually does. Because it's one of the last steps you have to do, you have to know a lot of information before you get to this point. So by now you've already known the backstory of what's happening. What happens is he's there on the ground and he's trying to figure out what was the name of this person that the wife's father had an affair with. He thinks about the question and he says, I barely remember her. It was so long ago. Oh, come on, there's gotta be something. Her name? Daphne? Daisy, maybe. Yeah. With some sort of flower. Daphne, Daisy, some kind of flower. Daphne and Daisy are two names that both start with D. So he is thinking about a name that starts with D. And then he says some kind of flower. There's two flowers that you've seen in this game already. There's one on the onesie, a picture of it. In fact, the name of it is even there, Dahlia. And there is one flower on the uh, dresser. And if you don't see the flower, you can actually water the plant. And if you've ever watered the plant, there's a little achievement for, for doing it. The plant grows continuously, even though the time loops keep happening. The plant doesn't reset progress, it keeps growing. And if you grow it to full bloom, it becomes a dahlia. And if you don't know what a dahlia looks like, the plant that grows up looks to be the same one on the onesie. And I really like that. That was really cool that that worked for me. Now, it doesn't work for everybody. This kind of design is not meant for everybody. What this video was meant to do is to show you that there are hints that were there. It just doesn't work for every single person. This is what a modern take on a point and click puzzle is. This is the genre that is pretty much effectively dead right now. It came back a little bit with things like Obduction and then Mist was a, like there's a new Mist with a bunch of all that stuff. Although I, I guess you could call the Witness point and click point. It's it's kind of a different one entirely because it has a, a different mechanic. Uh, but this is a genre, you know, that has been built from text adventures. So to see a game like 12 Minutes bring modern game design into an old genre like this is really, really cool. But people who are coming in who haven't played those older games are going to start questioning some of the logic. In fact, it's probably going to make less sense than most other linear type games. But for people who came from the point and click genre already, they'll, I think, very much enjoy this kind of gameplay. Some of this point and click puzzle stuff is always tried in things like uh, indie games. And in fact, I'm playing an indie game right now that has something like that called Fall for Greed. And if you like to see me talk about indie games and stuff, I have a different channel called Games Over More Coffee. You can see that's where I'm talking about indie games and stuff. If you just want to talk to me about all this stuff, or you want to talk to the community of Games Over Coffee, we have a Discord. But until then, I'm Devon, this is Half Calf, and uh, thank you for watching. And I'm going to keep drinking coffee from my tiny little IHOP mug. And as usual, it's cold because I haven't... I haven't got my my cup warmer. I don't know why I do that to myself.
see my dog right now. She's like, she's so, she gets so nervous whenever I turn on the camera and start talking to nobody. Say hello. <laughs>